Well, welcome. We've talked about a lot of political topics here at the center of the universe, but tonight, this is the first time we're going to talk about a constitutional amendment, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, something that normally we don't debate inside of Milford. But let's start with introductions. Oh, my name is Paul Lowenstein. I live in Sharon, and I appreciate the opportunity to be on the show tonight. Um, I uh, owned a small business, a printing business, which employed 10 people for approximately 17 years, and I sold it and uh, retired. And now I work full-time on trying to make the world a better place. I'm very fortunate and lucky to have the opportunity to study the issues and try to advocate for leaving the planet better than I found it, or the world, or the country, or whatever. I just feel very strongly that we have a problem here, uh, a problem related to uh, democracy. Um, in 2003, we passed uh, a law called the McCain-Feingold Act, or the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. Reform Act. Familiar with it? Uh, Somehow the Democrats and the Republicans managed to see eye to eye and find common ground on this issue of money and politics. And gradually, you know, we, the idea was to reduce the influence of big money in our political system. And before we get into it, we got poor Leo. Yeah. So let's Sorry. <laughs> we can tell you're passionate, but I don't want to leave. No, I'm launching too soon. I'm uh, Leo Imanen. Uh, I live in Rentham. Uh, I retired uh, eight years ago. I'm a uh, retired high school math teacher. I taught for 35 years and, and enjoyed it immensely. And uh, I've been able to do a lot of reading and studying on things. And uh, my father passed away at 99, and I retired at 66. And I figure I might have many more years to go. Mm. So I'd like to make, still make a contribution, even above and beyond what I did as a teacher. Paul, what's the problem? Well, as I started to explain before, we passed this law which where we found common ground. It's very hard to do in Washington these days. Especially and when it comes down to com campaign financing. Right. And we decided as a country that we would try to reduce the influence of big money in politics to give everybody a more a level playing field and equal voice in politics. And unfortunately in 2010, with the infamous Citizens United versus FEC decision of the Supreme Court, they struck that down, in effect. They said that we cannot limit money in politics because money is a form of speech. And since then, um, we have seen a tsunami of money rolling into our political process. And that is distorting the, uh, the political arena. Um, and as a result, uh, we have the influence of uh, the one percent, shall we say, the rich and the corporations and people with a lot of money. It used to be one person, one vote. That was the whole idea of our country, well, of democracy. Say, wasn't that the Constitution? Yeah. It starts, we <laughs> the <Yes>. people. We <laughs> I was going to say, are... we the people, right. not we the rich or we the poor. Exactly. It was we the people. And it's all the people, rich and poor. But unfortunately, uh, according to a, a study, a fairly recent study by uh, Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page, Martin Gillens from Princeton and, and Benjamin Page from Northwestern University did a study and they looked at 1700 policy decisions that were made in Washington and tried to decide are, is this decision uh, in favor of the few and the powerful or is this a decision that is good for the whole country and what they found is that there was no correlation at all between what is good for the people and the decisions that were getting made. It didn't matter whether most of the people were in favor of something or most of the people were opposed to it. It just didn't affect. But it did make a strong difference with respect to the rich. And they even had, I brought along an exhibit here which, which exhibits the principle. Um, the uh, average citizen's preferences, you can see there's, it doesn't matter if 10% of the people are in favor or 100%. It just doesn't affect the decision that gets made. However, if 90% if of the uh, economic elites prefer something, my goodness, the, the law tends to pass. And if they don't think that's in their interest, the law tends to Now, fail. economic elites. OK, people with a lot of money, people who can afford to give a million dollars or, okay. or whatever to political candidates. Because I always get a kick out of the definition of the rich. 
Yeah. That's always somebody who makes a couple dollars more than me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. when they say, who should we tax? Yeah. We should tax the rich. Yeah. Well, if I make $100 a year, anybody make more than 110 <laughs> Good so, point. But really, as I started to explain before, whereas it used to be one person would vote, now it's $1 million one vote. I mean, if you, if you don't have a large amount of money to contribute, you're, that's like a megaphone that drowns out the other voices when you have that kind of money to throw around. And the other problem that you get into when the money is sloshing around like that is that our, our elected officials have to spend half of their time approximately or possibly even more on the phone soliciting campaign well, if contributions. if you talk to any congressman, Paul, they'll mm -hmm. tell you that after the election they have a week or two that they can breathe. <laughs> And then the first thing they do, starting in week three, is get on the phone because they've got two years or three years to build up a war chest. Exactly. But now, with all good intentions, you hear about the super PACs yep. and you hear about the union. Because yep. to me, it, it feels, you know, if you're, well, now this year, even the Democrats have super PACs that are hitting That's hard. That's right. That's but in right. the old this days, the Republicans were the super PACs, and the Democrats had the unions, and they both had mega tsunamis of cash. Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, we felt it here in Milford where, you know, a recent election where just we start getting in propaganda. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the candidates tend to come on the show, and I'd ask one of them point blank. I said, I got this fecal matter put in my mailbox. Did you have anything to do with this document? Because it really is fecal matter. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And he said, no. It was done by an outside group. Right. And you're hearing now more and more that the presidential election is not only where they're looking to put money. Now they're looking for the Senate and the House and the locals. Mm -hmm. But that's all got to be mega dollars coming from somewhere. Right. So what we're interested in doing, since, since this problem was caused by a Supreme Court decision, the President cannot tell the Supreme Court what to do. Congress cannot tell the Supreme Court what to do. The only boss of the Supreme Court is the Constitution the itself. the Constitution. And that's where we get backed into this challenge of, of working towards a, 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 a constitutional amendment to negate the underpinnings, the foundations of the Citizens United decisions. There are two foundations of that. One is that corporations are people, or that artificial entities, I shouldn't say corporations because unions are included as artificial entities. So are nonprofits. You and I are living people, but a corporation is, is a legal artifact created by a, a charter, a state charter, it's not a living, breathing person. It, can, it lives forever. It, it can live in many places at once, especially a multinational corporation. And that's another whole issue about, you know, money maybe coming in from overseas and influencing our domestic politics that's of concern as well here. So um, it's really important that we uh, amend the Constitution to negate the foundations of that Citizens United decision, which are corporations or people, that's what they decided, that they have the First Amendment rights. And the other thing that, uh, the other second underpinning or foundation of the uh, Citizens United decision is that money is the same thing as speech. That when you spend money on speech, that's protected by the First Amendment. That's, that was what the Supreme Court decided. And, and so you have artificial entities able to use their corporate treasuries and uh, to influence our political system. And what that does is it creates, we have, we're supposed to have government of, by, and for the people. That was Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, right? That was a, a fundamental, I mean, that was the greatest speech ever given, and for a good reason. And now, maybe not so much. Government of, by, and for those who have a million dollars to contribute, as opposed to government of, by, and for the But isn't that why they people. allow the unions to pool their money? I mean, well, some of these unions feel like they're throwing as much money as some of the 1% elite or whatever you're saying. I see, 
Well, if you look at the statistics, you will see that corporations are pouring a lot more money into the political system than, than unions. That's a fact. But that's of no interest to me, uh, philosophically. I'm interested in removing the, the ability of either unions or corporations from contributing big dollars and getting special treatment as a result of their ability to give money to But isn't that the same, I mean, whether, let's say I am a CEO of a very large corporation mm -hmm. and I'm making, you know, ten, twenty million dollars mm -hmm. a year. Some of them do. Yeah. I can throw a lot of money in that will benefit my corporation. Yeah. You okay. Could. So to me, whether it's the company, the union, or a high net worth individual, to me, they all have about the same ability. Granted, and, and actually that brings up another Supreme Court decision that happened subsequent to Citizens. Citizens United was 2010. In 2014, there was a case called uh, McCutcheon versus FEC, uh, Federal Electric Commission. Yes, that's, uh, I don't know if you're aware of it or have heard of it, but McCut Sean McCutcheon is a billionaire. And um, he, uh, objected to limits on his ability to contribute political, to make a political contributions. And, uh, before McCutcheon decision, there was a, the, the aggregate total that a, a very wealthy person could give was something like $120,000 per election cycle. There were limits. And he said, this is violating my constitutional right to free speech because money is speech. And the Supreme Court agreed with him. So they eliminated the limits, and he can spend all the money he wants now as a, as a very wealthy person. So he basically has a much larger megaphone than I do. And again, getting back to the principle of one person, one vote, sure, he should be able to have a voice in politics, but it shouldn't be any louder than mine just because he has a billion dollars, and I don't. And that is also part of the mix here. So if we establish that money is not the same as speech, that opens the door. It doesn't limit money in politics, but it allows Congress to, like, as they did in 2003 with McCain-Feingold, to set limits according to we the people decide collectively. What should those limits be? They may be very high. They may be very low. That's up to the democratic process to work out, and that's a, that's a long process that we had been going down that road, but now the Supreme Court said we've reached the end of the But isn't there hypocrisy on both sides, Paul? I mean, I see George mm -hmm. Clooney saying, 348000 is a ludicrous amount, and yet that's what you paid to go to his dinner. Mm, yeah. If you wanted to go to his dinner to be a co-chair, at the end of the day, you want to go there, you're going to mm -hmm. pay 348000 that he was raising for the Democratic Party. Absolutely. It's, this is both sides of the fence. Yeah, that's what I'm a, saying. I mean, a nonpartisan issue. I'd love to say it's the Republicans do no, this or no, the Democrats no. do this. No, but it's both of them. They're both equally guilty. Yes. Oh, no question about it. It's you know, a, this is a, a... So how do you fix it? I mean, okay, it's broken. Mm -hmm. We all will agree, I want to have as much influence as you have. Mm -hmm. I think it's only fair. Mm -hmm. Well, how do we fix that? Well, this is where we, why we're here asking to amend the Constitution of the United States. Because since there was a... As Paul just talked about, there was a Supreme Court ruling that said, oh, money is speech. So the only way we can overrule them is by amending the Constitution and say money is not speech. Leo, talk to me. I'm, I'm an old man. Okay. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> who likes simple. Yep. How do you propose to fix it? To say we're going to do a constitutional amendment, great. It's like, do you love your mother? <laughs> Who's going to say no? <laughs> it's broken, yes. Let's amend the Constitution. We'll fix it. Great. How? Well, basically, the uh, Constitution allowed two ways of doing it. If the Congress realizes something is wrong, they can propose an amendment and send it out to states. And if three-quarters of the states say, yes, that's a good idea, we amend the Constitution. Or two-thirds vote inside of Congress. I understand the mechanism. Yeah. I guess I'm, I'm being a little mean, but... Well, I'd like to know you what now is. have a magic wand. Right. You have all the votes you need. Okay. What are you going to write on a piece of paper? What will be the... I mean, let's face it. As much as we can beat up on the Founding Fathers, that document wasn't too bad when you think of how few changes yep. have been made in a couple centuries. Right. That's right. So, okay, the Leo Paul Amendment. 
<laughs> what is it going to say that's going to fix this problem? One we could say corporations are not living, breathing people, and as such, they're not entitled to the protections that you and I have as human beings. And therefore, they should not have all these constitutional rights that you and I have. Again, you, you're drifting on me. Okay. So, okay, they have no rights. What does it change? Are you saying you're going to limit how much money can go into an election? What's the fix? And, and, and to go along with this idea, we have money as speech, as our First Amendment protection. By saying they're not people, they don't get the first right uh, protection of the First Amendment. Okay. And furthermore, we're going to say money is not speech, and our legislative leaders can go ahead and limit the amount of money spent on uh, political campaigns. So we have a mechanism where we can go ahead and determine what is the appropriate amount of money to use in campaigning, whether it be public financing or the limits on how much people put in, but allow our Congress, our leaders, to go ahead and make that determination, which the Supreme Court recently said they can't do that. And that's why we need to go to this amendment. So we would say if you're running for a selectman in Milford, you can spend 10 grand. If you're running for a senator in the United States Congress, you can spend a hundred grand. That would be, and that's it. That Finito would, la comedia. That would that would have to be worked out democratically. Through. Well, I'm not saying the number, but okay. the concept. The yeah. concept. Yes. I don't know what the number we is. We would that that limiting money. If we had that constitutional amendment that said artificial entities, unions, corporations, nonprofits, whatever, are not people, and money is not the same thing as speech and therefore can be regulated, then our, our elected representatives in Congress can go ahead and set limits. And if they set limits we don't agree with, we'll vote them out, but we'll have but to. But the concept, Paul, would be we're going to say if you're running for this office, the total amount of money to be spent is X. It could be that or it could be public financing. Of well, I'm not, I'm not saying there, who puts it up. Because then the next logical question I'd ask you is, well, then we're giving congressmen a salary. Mm -hmm. We're giving them expenses. So wouldn't it be just as easy to say, take the outside influence out, and I'm willing to pay, and bear with me, 200000 or $200 million, whatever it is, mm -hmm. out of our tax dollars mm -hmm. we could do that. to fund an election. Yeah, maybe you have to gather a certain number of, of uh, signatures in order to qualify for those things. Well, I mean, that was always the primary gig where you had to get so many percentage points. To get your if you got 5%, yeah. you qualify. Yeah. I mean, we're going to have to work that out. I don't have a magic answer for that, but I do know that we should be at liberty. Our elected representatives should be at liberty to reflect the will of the people and set limits if the people desire limits. I mean, maybe we don't put limits on it. But it shouldn't be illegal for Congress to set limits on money, and, and right now it is. And the only way we're going to make it legal, we're going to legalize those kinds of make it possible for our elected representatives to take actions like McPhee and Feingold and try to you know, work it out, is to amend the Constitution so the Supreme Court gets out of our way and says we can set these kind well, of limits. There certainly seems to be a large number of people that agree with the concept yeah. that we don't like what's happening. Right. I mean, yeah, if anybody ever told me that Donald Trump was going to be polling 50 percent, <laughs> you know, a couple of years ago, I would have found it hard to believe that they weren't on some kind of narcotic and having, you know, a yeah. vision. Yeah. But yet. You know, some of the things he says where he's saying, nobody buys me. I don't need anybody's money. Right. Right. The only thing that bothers me is, okay, so if that's the case, then you almost have to be a billionaire <laughs> to be right. able to do that. Who's going to run for office if you're not a billionaire? I mean, this yeah. is another problem. We need to have, th this has to be a battle of ideas, not a battle of who's got the deepest pockets. That's the point. We have to f figure out what's best for the country, or best for Massachusetts, or best for Milford. You know, it should be a battle of ideas. But God knows there are plenty of ideas well, floating I mean, around. If you look at it now, I mean, this recent primary where Jeb Bush spent $100 million to come in, I won't say last. Well, he, yeah. Right. 
but I mean, a hundred million dollars seems like an awful lot of money to not place in the right. top five or six. Right. Well, what we learned from that is money doesn't guarantee results, and therefore you can't just buy an election, which is good. I'm glad I mean, to that's hear that. A, that's a nice concept in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. However, by the same token, we're talking about what happens after the person's elected and they have received an inordinate amount of money from certain people, suddenly they had the ear of that representative or that senator to a far greater well, extent than I think is appropriate. I mean, whether I agree with candidate Trump or not, mm -hmm. and in many things like just, I can't, <laughs> I can't understand, but the one thing that he said that really made sense is Wall Street doesn't give a candidate a quarter million dollars to be ignored. That's right. He even said, he, right. remember that debate when he was up on the stage and he said to the, to the six or eight other candidates who were standing beside him, I've given money to lots I've of you. I've bought guys, all of you. And yeah. I expect something in return. Right. I've right. bought all of you. Yeah. And yeah. another thing to consider is the fact that, as we said before, there's a nonpartisan issue. What a lot of these, you know, very affluent uh, entities, whether it's a corporation or a billionaire, will do is give some money to both candidates. Of course. Doesn't right. matter which one wins. Again, I, mean, I hate Clinton. to use Trump, but he said, I gave money to Hillary, I gave money yeah. to, to you, Jeb, I gave... He's hedging his bets all over yeah. the place. Yeah, and I mean, there was a front page article uh, on the, uh, in the Globe, I think yesterday, about uh, Charles Koch, I think it was Charles, had yeah, endorsed... They're putting a little, a few pennies here and there into these yeah. campaigns. endorsed Hillary Clinton, said she was, but that just, to me, underscored the fact that you know, she's taken a lot of money, too. And it's not just, this is not a Republican or Democrat no, thing. And this is why I said, I can't, I would love to blame, you know, the Zubobnik party. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the Republicans, bad. Or the no, Democrats, no, 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 bad. No, no, no. But the thing that never, I could never understand is most of the incumbents tend to vote in ways that will help them stay in mm -hmm. office. That's you would think that limiting <laughs> campaign financing works to their advantage because they get free publicity they get to frank their notes and send out the nice little you know mail but their name is known by the voters you know if leo wants to run against our current senator mm -hmm. leo's going to have to spend a lot more money to get his name known mm -hmm. oh yes yeah so you know it totally befuddles me when i think if i'm a standing official, I think I would want to limit how much money is spent to keep the Leos quiet. Well, I think the, the, what comes to mind with me on that is that the system is working for those who have been successful. They're there. The system has, you know, worked out for them. And I, I'll give you an example. Um, back in the turn of the century, around uh, 1913, I believe, we passed the 17th Amendment to the Constitution, which allowed for direct election of senators. Uh, it was part of the populist and progressive movement, uh, experimenting in democracy around that time was when citizen ballot initiatives became legalized, and they really were into democracy at that time. The trust busters and all that, Teddy Roosevelt, and. They came up with oh, this. The whole Upton Sinclair, the muckrakers, yeah. that yeah. whole movement. But we can learn from history. And, and what, what happened then was we said, instead of being appointed by state legislatures, senators had to go out and campaign and, and, and get the vote of the people. And that legitimized you know, the government better because the people had a direct say in who gets elected. And the interesting thing about that amendment was it started, it, it was ratified in 1913. The thing got proposed in 1826. Oh my Lord, 90 years. And it went until about uh, 1898, I think. Um, and every time they would file a bill to do direct, what would happen is they'd vote on it in the House, but it'd get to the Senate and they'd let it die. They were comfortable. The system was working for them. Right. They weren't going to vote, period, end of story. And they didn't. So what happened was people finally got fed up and they said in 1898, let's use the other route. We see in the Constitution, it says here, Article 5 says. Well, we can get the states. 
If we, we can, can get, get three quarters of the states to vote. It's actually two thirds. I'm sorry. Two just like Congress. Two thirds, two -thirds can propose. Two -thirds. To, to make the request for an amendment. A proposal. Right. Yeah. Not, they can't amend the Constitution. That's a very important point. The states by themselves cannot amend the Constitution directly. What they do is if two thirds of the states vote to call for a convention, Congress is obligated to call a convention of delegates from the states, and those delegates will hammer out an amendment which they propose to the states. Now three quarters. Now of the it states, takes three quarters to a same as if Congress had proposed. Right. It. It's two different pathways to the same. But, it, it but at the end of the day, it still comes down to three quarters of the states have to ratify. ratify. That's the safety. And measure. then you get it. No, no amendment is going to get ratified without intense scrutiny. Now, well, now, I mean, that you think about it. One thing, Al, uh, one thing Paul didn't quite finish was on this direct uh, election of the senators, there was a proposal back then to have an amendment convention under Article 5 proposed by the states. We were almost at the two-thirds required to have it happen. At that time, the senators said, whoa, whoa, no, no, we'll go ahead and put out the proposal for amendment. Right. They didn't want to lose the power of the language and so forth, mm -hmm. so they went ahead and proposed it. We are now in the same situation. Well, it was a fait accompli. Yeah. So it was damage. If I read my history right, the Senate at that point said, okay, boys and girls, this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yes. They saw the writing. So let's wall. look at damage yeah. control yeah. and maintain some semblance of control. Exactly. Because otherwise, it's going to be totally taken away from us. Right. And, and there has never in the history of our country actually happened a, a convention, an Article 5 amendment convention. The, the pathway is there. We've never had to go all the way to the convention. We get close, Congress blinks, they propose sure. the amendment. And so the process, the, the founders realized that, that in the event that Congress gets stuck, the people, this gets back to we the people, the first three words, that we the people have got to have a, a mechanism, otherwise it's pitchforks and shotguns, you know? I mean, they didn't want it to come to that. They wanted a legal pathway to, for the people to put pressure on their elected officials, and if it comes to that, we'll have the, the uh, convention, but in We in can history, storm the Bastille, but we really don't want to. We don't right. want we to. We really don't want to have it so that... That's the genius of our government. Is yeah. that we have these checks and balances, and when Congress gets stuck, the founding fathers had the vision to see this might happen. Yeah, I mean, legitimately, they didn't want to make it too no. easy. Right, right. Shouldn't I mean, no you don't want be. Amendment number three hundred and forty-five. No. no, no. You know, and the brilliance is how few amendments have been needed. Right, right. very few. You know, and we can argue about everything that's wrong in this country, but I've always asked one basic question: Who's keeping you? You know, if there's a better place, yeah. then why are you living here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. No, it's brilliant. As far as I know, there's, it's not like the old Soviet Union where I couldn't leave. Right. If you want to leave and go to a better place, and <laughs> God bless you. That's Paul, a great I love this place, and that's why we're here. That's why we're here, yeah. <laughs> and I, I just wanted to look back at history a little bit more in terms of the Supreme Court. They, as I said in the beginning, you asked me what the problem was, and I pointed at the Supreme Court. And I want to point out that the Supreme Court's been wrong before. And if you go back to, say, the Dred Scott decision in 1853, I want to say, before the Civil War, they decided that slavery was legal and that slaves were property. And the Dred Scott had to go back south and be a slave. And the, the, what it took to undo that decision was a Civil War and three amendments. But you know, again, the Supreme Court, and I have high regard, got a good Holy Cross boy up there, mm. you know, um, <laughs> there are still people. Oh, yes. Sure. I mean, at the end of the day, they are not blessed, anointed, right. you know. They're not gods. Right. <laughs> you know, th these are not yeah. entities. Yeah. These are normal people. Right. Yep. Absolutely. And, yeah, and they, they can could. get it wrong. Sometimes they get it wrong. And another example is, in 1868, we passed the 14th Amendment, basically said equal protection Check. for all, right? Six years later, the Supreme Court decided that women are not eligible for the right to They're vote. They're not so equal. Not yeah. so equal. <laughs> you know, it's like, it like communism. We're all equal, just some of us are more equal than others. Yeah. Exactly. And it took another 46 years till 1920, and a heck of a lot of 
suffragettes and you know and organized they they paid dearly to overturn that decision but overturn it they did they and got I off the couch and they went because out, you know? being a father of two women that I am proud of me too you sit there and <laughs> say how could I ever have lived in a time where I want to limit right. artificially limit mm -hmm. what my daughters can do I mean our whole life we've taught them you want something bad enough you work hard enough right. just anything in your path run it over yes. right. male true. female don't care yeah but you know it, it amazes me when you look back and you say how could you really look at your own daughters I know it's very myopic of a view but you know my world is my family yeah. you know I look at my darling bride who's smarter than me biochemist by training I mean she just amazes me mm -hmm. that she would marry so far down but that's <laughs> <laughs> thank God she did yeah. make that one mistake a hundred years ago when we got married and I've never let her off the hook well, but you've you, climbed quite a way since then well but you know you sit there and say back then these were not stupid people no, that no. we elected to the Supreme Court. No, they didn't have any. So, you know, the infallibility of a decision does not hold weight with me. Right. Whatever reason, you know, if you sit there and say nine people thought a human being was property, mm. okay, I, I, nine people thought that my daughter, because of an alternate plumbing structure, was less than a male. Right. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I can't understand it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's always easy to look over your shoulder. Right. Well, the history of the country has been one of ever-expanding democratic rights. Uh, in the beginning, of course, the Founding Fathers, for all their brilliance and genius, 5% of the population had the right to vote. Rich male landowners. That was it. Rich white male With, thank landowners. Yes. Right, yeah. right, right. And since then, we've gradually expanded that circle of enfranchisement to include just about everybody. And that has been, the, again, the genius of, of our government is that we get to expand that and push it. And it has, takes effort. We've got to push the boundaries. And when we see something that's broken, we've got to go out and fix it, get off the couch and get up and be but active. But you're spending mm -hmm. a lot of time defining that a company is not a person. Mm -hmm. You know, that an artificial entity shouldn't have the same rights as I do. Mm -hmm. Okay. But isn't the, the root problem, the root cause of the issue, a disproportionate influence can be bought? Yeah. And, and that's, that's true. It. And However, in order to, we can't just say you can't limit money alone unless you get rid of that uh, First Amendment, that free speech. And therefore, that's why the two of them have to go together. See, that's where I have a problem, because I get a kick out of the candidates. Very recently, I heard one candidate complaining that the other candidate is flying around in a private jet. And this candidate spent $20 million <laughs> in a private jet, of exp expenses in a private jet. I'm like, hello, pot, this is the kettle. What color are you today? <laughs> yeah. You know, so I guess my problem that I have is when I try and figure out, am I really trying to limit your speech? Nope, you can go around and yell all you want. Mm. You know, you can spend your whole life campaigning for, I mean, the First Amendment protects my right to be stupid. Mm -hmm. As much as I don't like things like Nazis and all, mm -hmm. I've got to accept the fact that the reason I get to think the way I do is that they get to think the way they, they do. And as long as they don't infringe on me, as so much as I don't like it, mm -hmm. i got to live with it. But you turn around and say, now, wait a minute. Turning the, flipping the paradigm to say, we're going to allow candidates to have the same amount of money in the election, period. I don't know how that limits anybody's free speech. It doesn't. We're not talking about limiting the free speech of any individual. That doesn't change. What we're asking is to limit the First Amendment rights applied to artificial entities. We have a body of business law that allows businesses to, to conduct their affairs uh, for the purposes of suing or being sued. Um, the Paul, the why should I as a billionaire have a stronger voice than you? You shouldn't. 
So it's not just the artificial. I'm not an artificial entity right, if right, I'm a billionaire. Right, right, right. No, that's another part of it. I'm a person. But when you take away the money out of politics, it, it, it levels the playing field, both with respect to artificial entities and billionaires. Right. Then we all have, the, as citizens who live in this country, whether rich or poor, we all have a more or less equal voice in the political process. If we don't choose to speak up, that's our business. But if we want to go talk to our elected representative, he's going to worry just as much about you as me or a billionaire as me because we all have one vote, and he's got to worry about every vote. So he's going to listen to everybody. Rich, poor, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you have a, something on your mind, call up your, your representative and talk to him. If I want to be mean, Leo, is this like world peace? Hmm. That we all agree it should happen, but it I, can I, never happen? I look at, we've amended the Constitution 27 times, so it's been done. <laughs> and it's not easy, but it's been done. Whereas world peace... We haven't yet accomplished. We haven't found that yet. So I wouldn't make it as hard as world peace. <laughs> and the, the, they say that perfection is the enemy of good. Uh, we can make our system better. It doesn't mean that if we amend the Constitution like this that everything's going to be hunky-dory. You know, we, the Democratic, I think Winston Churchill said it, uh, uh, democracy is um, the worst form of government in the world except for all the others. Except for all the others. So what he's saying basically is don't expect perfection here, but we... We have got to, you know, do the best we can here. And I think we can do better than what we're doing now if we can remove the influence of money and get back to one person, one vote. And for one thing, I think what will happen, too, is when people realize that their influence is just as great as their neighbors, that they will get involved in the process. It will encourage them to go vote. It will encourage them to pick up the phone and call our congressman because they know that they have just as much of a voice as anybody else. Yeah, and I mean, it happens at every level. You think about it, just here in Milford, le not last week, there's a $1,000 fundraiser, a $1,000 plate fundraiser. Hmm. I mean, that's a lot of money. For a lot of people. Sure oh, is. yes. It filters you know, out most Forget people. the million. I couldn't go to that. <laughs> you know, forget the, the millionaires that, or the billionaires donating a million dollars. Bring it right down to local. Mm -hmm. $1,000 a plate. Wow. Yeah. You know, it wasn't a few years ago where to go have lunch local in Hopkinton was $500 that you donated to go and shake Cheney's hand, which is how long ago it was. <laughs> um, so it's not just at national politics. Right. Which is very true, and I, yeah. I fully appreciate that. And fortunately, by working with our state legislators, who we can still talk to, and they still know our names, we can convince them that we need to change now before they get bought themselves, because right. the influence will trickle down and keeps coming on lower and lower levels. So, yeah, I'm very frightened of that prospect. But isn't there a limit on what we can give state candidates? Well, here, here in the state of Massachusetts, we don't have bad uh, campaign finance laws. We have some of the better in the United States. However, that doesn't have to stay that way. Uh, if we get people with the wrong influences changing those laws, they can change that. Uh, so we need to protect it now while we still can. Well, the Supreme Court precedent of, of Citizens United, it's just a matter of time before somebody challenges those limits here in Massachusetts. And if they're going to be consistent, they got to throw them out. But I mean, now with the super PACs and all, are there really limits? If I no. donate enough money <laughs> and I say, I really don't like this guy, Leo, mm -hmm. he's running for state Congress. And all of a sudden, you get the fecal matter <laughs> brochures because it really was trash. Yeah. Yeah. You know, no, people like me, I really believe in Milford. I love this town, mm -hmm. and I really trust our town meeting members and our people who are helping this town grow. To have some outsider who maybe looked up Milford on a map write trash and tell me that I shouldn't vote for mm. my congressman in Boston really annoyed me. Mm -hmm. You know, I hate to say I was influenced, but I have to admit I was because I would vote against it. If I, if, if I was, you know, on a level playing field between the two of you, I don't know that I wouldn't get annoyed enough that how dare you have people try and convince me not to vote for yeah. Paul, because I'm going to vote for him then just to show you. <laughs> I, I had a couple of thoughts what you just said. One was, if I were the 
politician running for office, I would find it frustrating and scary to have somebody else putting stuff out where, where it's not my message anymore. It's mm -hmm. somebody else putting out dirt. The second problem I have is who is putting this money into these packs? The point is some of this is coming through corporation channels and it may well be people from outside the United States. And to me, why should we in the That's United States allow anybody yeah, to come in and influence extension. our elections? You know, I get annoyed when people from outside of Milford yeah. are trying to influence how I vote for a Milford candidate. Mm -hmm. Let in mind somebody from the Middle East I know. trying to influence how I'm voting for national. But I see it because you look at some of the discussions going on about the strategies of controlling the House controlling the U.S. Senate. And if they see a weak candidate in North Dakota, hmm. all of a sudden national money is being poured into yeah. that election because we can pick up a red or a blue seat. Mm -hmm. And frankly, yeah. I get annoyed because yeah. neither one yeah. will accept me anymore. <laughs> right. I mean, I've yeah. learned. I do. One of the shows we have here is the liberal view. Mm. And because I really do believe I am a fiscal conservative. I believe you only spend the money you have. Waste is a bad thing. Well, I mean, you know, I, I listen to, you know, you quote from England, Churchill, I always remember Maggie Thatcher saying, socialism is wonderful till you run out of other people's money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I can't be blue because I'm too physically conservative, yet I can't be red because I don't pass the litmus tests. Mm. I mean, the first thing when somebody yeah. says gay, and I say, who cares? Yeah. No, you're supposed to say bad. Mm -hmm. So get yeah. out. Yeah. So, so I guess, Al, you would call you a citizen. <laughs> I, I call me purple. Because yeah. I'm right in between the two. Yeah. And it's not because I went to Holy Cross. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, to me, I don't like anybody who spouts dogma. I mean, the far yeah. right scares me as much as the far left. You know, and you sit there and say, wait a minute. I don't want to put money to unseat somebody in Idaho. Or Wyoming, because mm -hmm. I don't know anything about them. Yeah. The same way, I don't want them putting money to unseat somebody who I grew up with right. in my own town. Yeah. You know, I give this talk from time to time, and it's actually on YouTube. This fixing our broken democracy um, review of the history of democracy. And when I give that talk, a lot of times I'll ask people in the audience to put up their hand if they are personally acquainted with their state representative or state senator. And maybe half the hands go up, or a lot of hands go up. Then I ask, how many of you are personally acquainted with your congressman in, in, in Washington? And very few yeah, yeah. hands go up. So this is where the people have a more intimate relationship with their elected representatives at the state level than they do at the national level. And this is why we're trying to, uh, uh, our strategy for amending the Constitution is to follow this Article 5 uh, Amendment Convention route, hoping that if we get enough states lined up, that it will put pressure on Congress to propose the kind of amendment that we need, the two-part amendment. Uh, corporations and, and artificial entities, unions are not people, and uh, money is not speech. So we have actually succeeded, we nationally, have actually succeeded in f getting four states on board. They voted to call for an Article 5 convention on this topic. Got to ask you, which four? Vermont, California, Illinois, New Jersey. That's a pretty wide. Yeah. Oh, yes. It's a I mean, when you say Vermont and California, it's a yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. That, that kind of yeah. feels. Yeah. yeah. Illinois, yeah. though. Yeah. yeah. Illinois, New Jersey, those are the four. We've come close in New Hampshire. It passed, I think, the Senate, but it, no, it passed the House. It fell like one vote short in the Senate. It was very close. We came close. It passed one chamber in Maryland. It passed one chamber in Delaware. So there's, and Hawaii also. So there, there are lots of states where a bill has been filed, and it's working its way through. But there's no statute of limitations either. No, you know? that's correct. That's an important so point to make. Something to remember. That can last for decades. Yep. Longer Unless than they re-vote yeah. to call yeah. for a reconsideration That's exactly right. and then vote and rescind it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Illinois is 
Illinois is on a positive. California is yep. on a positive. Right. right. And they can just wait for 90 years like the, <laughs> the other? Well, hopefully not. I mean, we're working on this because um, we're, I personally am very concerned about the economy. Um, you know, we, we had, in fact, they brought a, an illustration here. Uh, this was done by uh, a professor at, at Harvard, um, a Moss, a Professor Moss. And he, he plotted bank failures uh, since, uh, I think it was 1865. Uh, uh, and you, you had this business cycle where you had boom and bust and recessions and, and prosperity and then crash again until the big crash of the, of the Great Depression. The 30s. And boy, that was painful. So in 1933 and, and in the early 30s, we started passing laws such as Glass-Steagall to stabilize the economy. Yeah, let me hold this so you okay. can move your hands. I was going to say. We stabilized the economy, and for f almost 50 years, we went with virtually no recessions or bank failures. We had a stable economic um, climate. And then beginning in the early 1980s, we started rolling back, deregulating the financial um, system and uh, not enforcing some laws and repealing some laws. We replaced, repealed Glass-Steagall, for example. And lo and behold, the bank failures started up again. And we ended up uh, most recently with the Great Recession of 2008 and 9, when millions of Americans lost their homes, lost their life savings. It was a disaster. And I believe that that has some, that there is a place for regulation in the financial industry and that all regulations are not good and all regulations are not bad. But when the financial industry has the political clout to roll back all regulation mm -hmm. and it's, it becomes a vi virtual casino on Wall Street that we start to run into some real problems that affects real people. And I think you know, if we had our democracy back, that we could um, potentially uh, re revisit some of those laws that we know from experience, from historical experience, actually worked and stabilize the economy. So that's something that. Well, I mean, it came out in this year's uh, presidential um, race where, like I said before, one candidate brought up that, hey, by the way, these banks don't give a quarter million dollars to be ignored. You know, so if I've kicked in, if enough of us have kicked in a quarter million apiece, I want at least to be listened to. Mm -hmm. yeah, and sure. if I'm naive enough to believe that, you know, you and four friends got together and raised a few million bucks, but you're never going to bother me again or never expect me to be a little more sympathetic to you, mm. uh, shame on me. Yeah. Shame on me. Yeah. You know, I mean, I feel like sometimes some of these candidates are insulting my intelligence. <laughs> I know I'm not that smart, but, you know, when you sit there and say, yes, well, this, this entity kicked in half a million dollars, and I just so happened coincidentally to take up their cause. Mm. But it was a coincidence. I was going to do it anyway. Right. Yeah, yeah. We know money strains credibility. gives influence, yeah. and it, it pulls strings, and it gets that ear if, to If it didn't through. work... These people that give the money are smart people. They understand return on investment. One of the highest returns on investment that a business, a large business, can make is to invest in, in the political system. Of course. That's why they do it. They're not stupid. It doesn't well, always they work. They could be ignored without giving hmm. a quarter to a half a million dollars. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you think about it. That's right. Good I point. Mean, Leo, you're probably being ignored by a lot of congressmen. Hmm. Oh, yes. Um, I, I write my letters, I send my emails. No, but I'm just saying, realistically, yeah. we're all being ignored. Yep. But we're not giving half a million dollars and saying, look, I want to give you this money to ignore me. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> right? Right. I'll just, I won't give you any money, you'll ignore me. If I give you half a million dollars, it's not to be ignored. Getting back to this idea that the people are closer to their state representatives than they are to their congressmen in Washington, and the strategy of... Uh, getting, we need 34 states to sign up for this to really reach the end game. Well, hopefully, we won't have to go that far before Congress will blink. No, and Congress will see the tsunami once right, again. Right. But 
here in Massachusetts, we live in the birthplace of American democracy. You know, the Tea Party and the, the Concord, Lexington. I mean, we started it all. We were, we were at the at the vanguard, and we need to jump on this wagon along with these other states. So, back in 2012, actually, let me roll back a, a little. Uh, actually, it was in 2012 that Massachusetts legislature responding to. We put this question on, on the ballot in like 151 towns in Massachusetts, one by one. Uh, PS, citizens went out and gathered enough signatures to you put it on the ballot. half the municipalities yeah, of the Commonwealth. A lot of them, maybe not quite half, but a lot. That's a, a very large sample. Well, out of 330, you got 150. Right. It's yeah. Yeah. close yeah. enough. Close the enough. math teacher will right. disagree. Right. It's not 50.0 percent, but that, close that, that enough. That would have argue. Close yeah. to 50. We, we had a lot of towns. And the average, we put this question on the ballot, you know, uh, about uh, Citizens United and um, uh, constitutional rights for corporations and money is not speech. I don't remember the exact wording of the ballot question, but it, it spoke to this issue. And 79% of the, of the total number of people who got an opportunity to vote on that voted to support, to get money out of politics. Well, again. No, nothing gets 79%. Well, let me think about this one. You're telling me, it's like, who do I tax? Mm -hmm. Well, you tax the people above me. So if I am one of the 99% or mm -hmm. one of the 90% making less than 100 mm -hmm. some thou a year, mm -hmm. and you tell me that the people above are benefiting from this to my detriment, why am I going to vote against myself? Mm, well, I think it, 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 it may go a little deeper than that. Uh, I think people believe in democracy. We were all taught in grade Well, that's what I'm school. saying, but women, you're telling me that the way the system is set up, mm -hmm. that people making more than whatever, a couple hundred thousand, whatever, but that's five, ten percent of the whole country, get a louder voice. If they contribute, yeah. Than I do. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, would you vote for them or for you? Well, 80% mm -hmm. doesn't surprise me because 80% mm -hmm. of the people are not going to be attending um, George Clooney's three hundred thousand dollar dinner, One or the thousand dollar dinner for our local politics. Well, be that as it may, the state legislature responded to that by voting for a resolution to call on Congress to propose the amendment that we need. The the money's not speech. Artificial entities are not people. Um, and fifteen other states besides Massachusetts also voted to call on Congress without any real leverage, right. just at, pretty please would you propose the amendment that we need. And that was in 2012. So it's now 2016, four years have passed, and we have not seen Congress take action. So what we're proposing is that Massachusetts follow the lead of these other four states and pass a bill which we filed uh, uh, about a little over a year ago in January of 2015 called the We the People Act, um, which specifies this uh, two-part amendment. It's spelled out. And it's, it calls for uh, an, uh, an amendment convention, Article 5 amendment convention, because we're saying now, you didn't listen to us in 2012. We're going to tighten the screws a little bit and ask for, um, for the legislature to call on Congress, or not to call on Congress, but to call for a convention. You're doing the same thing as 17. You're hoping so you'll build up enough. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, enough of That's a right. wave that Congress says, yeah. I'm going to get wet. Yeah. <laughs> and the wave yeah. is coming. Yeah. I can't sidestep it. I'm going to get wet. Yeah. So here we are in Massachusetts. We're Massachusetts citizens. It's the best we can do. This is our part of the grand scheme, the national so you effort. you've got four states, yeah. so there's at least four other people in your group. Yeah. How big of a movement do you really have? Well, well that will be a, the test of time will tell us how much. But right now, we're making the effort right here, and we'll hopefully we'll have brothers and sisters elsewhere in other states doing the same thing. Because we look at the current political climate, we hear people are not happy. Otherwise, we wouldn't have these strange results we have in the presidential. Well, I mean, otherwise, let's face it, if I am very content with the current system, I'm going to want to vote for political insiders. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? I'm real happy things are working in Congress. The Republicans and the Democrats get along so well. <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't want to kick those people out because they're doing so many great things together. Uh, right. <laughs> okay, so now let me get off the narcotics I've been on, if I believe that, and sit there and say, you know, you see the Ben Carsons, 
the Donald Trumps, you know, all these people that have no political experience. Right. And why are people voting for them? Personally, I don't know that they're voting for them or they're not voting against what they see I agree as with political that. deadlock. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So we filed this bill in January 20th of 2015. We rounded up uh, over 90 state legislators, about 70 in the House and about 21, I believe, in the um, Senate to co-sponsor our bill. We got dozens of organizations to endorse the bill. We got dozens of business people to sign a letter uh, asking our state legislators to vote for this bill. We, we attended, we uh, testified at a hearing on October 28th called by the Veterans and Federal Affairs Committee where the bill has been parked since we filed it. Uh, asking, and, and we must have had how many? You testified, I, I testified. I would say at least 70 people showed up to testify yeah. that day. And well, there might have been three that were testifying against that. I mean, it was overwhelmingly in so favor. So why, what would be the logic that they say we don't want the We the People bill? I, I, I would say the primary thing is some people have this red herring, this unfounded fear of this Article 5 Amendment Convention. I think some people at the higher levels feel there would be a thing called a runaway convention where they'll go ahead and rewrite the entire no, constitution. No, no, no. I, I could see the paranoia of Pandora's box yeah. being opened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that it exists and it's real yeah. and we know that. But is there not a check that says if you decided to do away with the First Amendment, the Second <laughs> Amendment, right. What are the odds that if you came, you still have to have it voted on? Yes, yeah. three Has quarters of the states. I want to say, <laughs> the ratification, you cannot get around that no. pesky little <laughs> stipend in there that says, you can come out and say, okay, dogs get to vote. <laughs> yeah. But then you've got to get three quarters of the states like to that. agree that puppies get a vote. Yep. Not only that, imagine you're a state legislature and you have voted to call for an amendment as, as our bill does, and, it, and it's to do certain things. And somebody hijacks and somebody it. Somebody hijacks it. Your delegate you, was sent down there right. to do that. Now he comes back and he's proposed something completely different. Yeah, I'm sorry. Are you going to vote? Voters know. Yeah. yeah, they'll never ratify it. It, it won't happen. It can't one happen. person, one vote. So we have a radical concept. I know. <laughs> It'll be interesting in the future to have you come back <laughs> and talk about the progress yeah. because it's like. Do you love your mother? How can you say each of us right. shouldn't have the same rights and the same influence? Yep. So yeah. I hate to stop us because I mm. could go and enjoy this for a long time. But as always, to our six loyal viewers, thanks for joining <laughs> in. Uh, I thank you for coming to the center of the universe here uh, in Milford. Um, and I've always said there's 28,000 of us that know Milford is the center of the universe. Six billion need to be educated. So we have a bigger <laughs> task than you do. <laughs> you only have to convince a couple hundred million. Yeah. But as always, may God bless and may tomorrow be a better day than today. Thank you for joining.